When I was an undergrad, one of my favorite things to do after a long hard study sesh was sit on the couch and play video games. But as I progressed throughout my degree, I started learning about the things that I could be doing besides actually studying that still improved my test scores and my GPA. Unfortunately for my post-study video game binges, the first research paper I looked at actually studied the effects of which post-study activity is most beneficial for learning and memory. Kinderman et al. took a group of participants and they said, okay, you guys go learn either a route of a city map, a couple words in a foreign language, or recall some facts about the construction of a library. Essentially from there, they split the participants up into three groups. What they found was that the group that had exercised immediately after studying had significantly higher test scores on what they learned than either the video game group or the control group. Now, if you're wondering why that was the case, let me introduce you to my alter ego, Dr. Chai. <coughs> To understand why the exercise group had significantly higher scores than either of the other groups, let's go back to Physiology 101. When we exercise, a neurohormonal response called the fight or flight response is activated. Adrenaline and cortisol, amongst other hormones, work together to increase heart rate and blood pressure. And as heart rate and blood pressure go up, cerebral perfusion is increased, meaning that more blood flows to the brain. With increased blood flow to the brain, this gives the neurons within the central nervous system more opportunities to uptake oxygen oxygen and nutrients from the bloodstream into the cell. This allows the neurons to form those synaptic connections that we call memory. Regular exercise wasn't always something that was a part of my daily routine. That being said, ever since I started incorporating it into my schedule, it's something that I can't really imagine going without. The mental clarity that comes from regular physical activity is something that nothing else can really replicate. Learning essentially happens in three phases. You have encoding, consolidation, and retrieval. Encoding is easy. This is the part that happens the first time you read a textbook or the first time you listen to your prof give a lecture provided you're actually paying attention to what's being said. Consolidation is the process of moving that information from your short-term memory to your long-term memory, and retrieval, obviously, is what happens on test day. Now, at some point in the near future, I'll do a video about why retrieval practice is much more effective than typical methods of study that students like, such as rereading and highlighting their notes. But to honor the purpose of today's video, I'm gonna stick to talking about things that have been shown to improve your GPA that don't involve actually studying. When I was in first year, everybody told me that biology was one of the hardest courses I would take throughout my whole undergraduate degree. Before one of the first midterms, I was super scared and I decided that I'd have this idea where I just stayed up all night and study before going into the exam without even sleeping for an hour. I did it and I kind of regret it because what I didn't understand about learning and memory at the time is that consolidation is largely a process that occurs during sleep, specifically REM sleep. During a typical eight hour sleep cycle, the body and brain progress through four stages of sleep followed by rapid eye movement. Essentially, rapid eye movement is a period of sleep where the brain is the most active, hence this is when we experience dreams. Coincidentally, it's also where the hippocampus is the most active in strengthening neural connections that transfer information from our short to long-term memory. The problem that plagues most university students within a Western society is that as they gear up for their final examinations, students tend to sacrifice hours of good quality sleeping time for additional hours of study. While this may seem logical to their end goal of trying to obtain higher test scores, students effectively inhibit the consolidation of learnt information from their short to long-term memory. Now I know this is a 
lot easier said than done, but honestly guys, the best way to ensure that you're still able to get eight hours of sleep and your life isn't completely flipped upside down during exam season is to space your studying out over very long periods of time. When I was an undergrad, I developed what's called the four week and two day rule, which essentially means that four weeks before the actual exam date, I started reviewing the content from earlier on in the course, regardless of whether or not the course was actually finished. And two days before the actual exam, I told myself that I had to be ready to take the exam two days early. Okay, let's recap. So we know that sleep is essential for the consolidation of learned information and increased cerebral perfusion delivers more oxygen and nutrients to the brain, which allows neurons within the central nervous system to form stronger synaptic connections between one another. But what if there was a way to increase both the quality and quantity of blood flow to the brain? As a second year undergrad student, I was a little bit wiser because I was exercising regularly and I certainly wasn't pulling any more all-nighters after that episode in first year. But at the same time, I still had a lot to learn. During finals week, I got stressed again and I said, you know what, forget about it. I'm just going to not cook this whole week and I'm just going to eat pizza for breakfast, lunch and dinner. But at the end of that week, I started feeling my mental acuity decline and I wasn't able to think as fast as I normally could. Now, if you're wondering why this is, well, it all goes back to cerebral perfusion. <clears throat> there is a twofold negative effect of fast foods on our cognition. Foods like fries, burgers and pizzas are often high in grease saturated and trans fats. These substances are difficult for our digestive systems to break down, meaning that as they enter the body, blood is diverted away from the brain towards the digestive tract. This often has the net effect of leaving individuals who consume such foods feeling lethargic rather than energized after their meal. Secondly, these fast foods are often no comparison in terms of nutritional value when pitted against fresh produce, lean meats, and whole grains from your local grocery store. Therefore, the net effect of consuming these edible food-like substances is not only to decrease cerebral blood flow, but the blood that does reach the brain when one is eating in such way is often nutrient poor when compared to the blood of an individual who maintains a healthy diet throughout their exams. In my own personal life, I've noticed that sometimes the simplest and most effective changes are often the most difficult ones to actually make. When it comes to eating healthy, getting enough sleep, and scheduling regular exercise for myself, it helps that I'm in a career that I genuinely enjoy. Don't get me wrong, I love pizza, burgers, and fries as much as the next guy. But at the same time, those are sacrifices that I'm willing to make 9 times out of 10 for the benefit of being able to perform at a very high level for a very long period of time. Yeah. Free as a bird, on light wings I ride. Free as a fly, 